Greetings, attendees, and welcome. If you could please log in your name and where you're tuning in from in the comments box, much appreciated. Like this video so others in your network can also enjoy this content. Welcome to IFMA's second webinar specific to the North American O&M Benchmark Report. Today's webinar is titled, Cost Impacts, A Lesson Learned, A Review of COVID-19. The current North America O&M Report is available for purchase in the IFMA bookstore. If a member's cost is $295, non-members is $485. Also for the month of December, IFMA is offering a 20% discount on all IFMA bookstore products. Pays to be an IFMA member. Today's presenter is Jake Smithwick, PhD, MPA, FMP, and SFP. Associate Professor, Graduate Program Director, Construction and Facilities Engineering at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Over to you, Jake. All right. Thank you, Nick, and thank you, for everybody, for being here today. We're excited to go through this presentation. It's an extension of a presentation we had a few months ago about the North America Operations Benchmark Report. So if you haven't seen that, be sure to check it out, and uh, today we'll be offering some additional information. Uh, be sure to chime in here with any comments or questions. Uh, we're on LinkedIn and on YouTube as well, so be sure to add questions, and uh, we'll certainly see that and address those as we go along here. So with that said, uh, today's agenda, we'll go through the benchmarking process to kind of set the stage for what benchmarking really means and how this is applicable to you as a facilities professional. We'll talk about the data set, uh, some of the demographics and the characteristics of the people that um, responded to the survey. We'll go through the cost impacts from COVID-19, some of the practices and operational changes that we've seen. And then I thought we might close out with a, a brief discussion about how do we find expert janitorial and custodial service providers. And so we'll have a brief discussion on what that entails and uh, hopefully that'll be useful as we go through here. So that said, we'll go ahead and jump in. So to think about benchmarking, uh, the goal of benchmarking is to make sure that we get good quality information that we can do something with it. If you have a bunch of data in your facilities and we don't use that or we don't do anything with it, it's challenging because, well, we're not exactly sure how we're going to make a change based on what they da that data is telling us here. So effective benchmarking means that we have information and we do something with it. We make a change to how we're running our facilities, right? So um, another reason why we've focused on this here is to make sure that we provide uh, useful data to the professionals, identify the challenges, and really focus on the FM expertise that's in uh, North America. So that's where this report is based on, but our opinion is that a lot of the data and the practices that we learned from uh, responding to COVID-19 can be applied in other regions as well. But this particular data set came from North America, and you'll see that as we as we go through this. A little bit about our research group. Uh, we're with Simplar. I'm a, like I was mentioning, I'm a professor at the University of North Carolina in Charlotte, and we partner with uh, contractors, owners, facility professionals, all focused on becoming a client or a vendor of choice. And we do that through benchmarking, procurement, project delivery. And if you certainly have questions, uh, be sure to reach out to us and we can chat further about that. So let's go through the data set and kind of describe uh, where we came in from and uh, what our data panel uh, looks like here. So a brief history, uh, the North America report, the 2021 version or the 22 version that was just published, uh, that is based on a long set of reports that we've published over the years. And this is no uh, no stranger that we've, we've built on the previous report. So 2017 was one of the first major updates to the IFMA reports. Um, it's, again, it's been on uh, here for a number of years, uh, I think about 20 years or so before 2017. But 2017, we really made some major updates to the report. 2018, we had a follow-on report that focused on more of the qualitative practices. We had the space planning report in 2020. And uh, quick matter of fact, that was published right before basically the entire uh, world shut down uh, due to COVID. So that was published, uh, that was released in April of 2020. And the data was collected for that between December of 19 and January of 2020. So that data is just before uh, everything shut down. And that report actually is in the process of being updated. So be sure to keep your eyes out um, later next year, uh, middle of next year as we, as we wrap that up. And then finally, and uh, last year, we had the Global Salary and Compensation Report that looked at uh, pay levels, insurance, benefits, uh, other benefits to FMs, 
And so be sure to, to, to take a look at that. So the reason why I've gone to this history of reports because that sets the stage for this new report and where that data is actually coming from here. Now, when you think about benchmarking, there's a lot of literature out there, but really is really focused on a, a five-step process or five phases when you think about benchmarking. We're going to be starting with, uh, you know, what is our benchmarking process? What are we actually focusing on? We'll collect that data based on what our metrics are. We'll compare and analyze that data. We'll then hopefully take action, and then we'll do this again. It's a continuous process that as we go through the future, as we go through our data, that will help us prepare for the future as we look at this. So the benchmarks reports, the, the best way or where this falls into this overall process is in this third phase here, comparing and analyzing the data that we collect here, right? So in our view, when we think about the future of facilities management, the effective FM will be focused on um, how do we benchmark effectively and how do I help my organization do more with what I currently have available here. So that's how we think about benchmarking and be sure to, to think about that as you, as you go through and develop your own benchmarking strategies. So the way this report was collected, we'll go through the methodology. The first thing we started with the previous uh, North America owner reports and the other regions as well. We had a group of uh, pilot testers or subject matter experts that reviewed the survey, took the survey, provided comments on the survey and suggested other data points for us to consider. It was then sent out to all IFMA uh, members, uh, facility professionals, and also open to non-IFMA members. In total, we received 1,900 survey responses, which is just absolutely incredible. Um, when you think about the level of detail that the survey asked about, uh, the fact that we had almost 2,000 people respond to the survey is, is truly incredible. Now, to be clear about this, um, not all 1,900 people did the entire survey. There is some attrition as we went through the survey, and, and the report kind of shows that. But we had 1,900 people actually provide some data. In fact, most of that data, a lot of that, is based on the COVID uh, responses and impacts, which we're talking about today here. So we had a very good data set. Uh, the costs that are presented uh, in the report are based in US dollars or Canadian dollars, and those are called out throughout the report. So if uh, depending on where you live at, uh, those can be also be, be useful. We asked respondents to identify what sector that their facility serves. So if I have a, um, if I work in the business sector, uh, so banking or financial or whatever, uh, we do break that down and we provide details uh, based on that. We also asked respondents to describe what type of building they have. So are they a single building? Are they multiple buildings in multiple locations like a portfolio or the campus? So there's different ways to uh, classify the, the buildings. Within the regions, um, most of the data came from the uh, United States. Uh, and you can see the breakdowns here. So we have Can Can Canada, we have New England, Northeast, Mid-Atlantic, and other regions as well. We have the total number of respondents represented from each region. And we also have the percentage of people um, that are going to be providing for that as well, right? So again, folks, uh, as you go through this here, be sure to take a look and add comments or questions as you might see this, and then we'll get into some additional detail now. The average age of the facilities, uh, we asked respondents how old is the overall facility? Um, so less than five years, five to 10 years, all the way down to more than 100 years. There is a handful of responses that are is primarily in the in institutional category. So these are uh, mostly public uh, buildings, so historical buildings. And there's a number of folks that have uh, facilities that are quite old uh, from that standpoint. Space management, so again, different breakdowns by the type of building they have and how do they own that space, do they lease it, and so we have different breakdowns uh, based on that. And then finally, is a square footage per occupant. So we looked at the average number of occupants in the buildings and then compared that to the total space of the buildings and divided those out, and so that calculates the square foot uh, per occupant. Now, what we've seen here is that the space per occupant allocation has nearly doubled since the previous uh, report. Uh, our, our opinion as to why this is happening is that there's obviously fewer people in the building. The building size is staying the same. So therefore, the people that are on site have more space per person. Now, one caveat about this, and as we're working on the new space planning report, what we're seeing is that the historical measures of space occupancy are not necessarily applicable 
uh, as as much as they were in the past. So we are looking into that as to what those new metrics should look like in terms of space allocations. And so be sure to keep an eye on that. Or if you have comments or, or other insights on that, we would definitely would like to chat with you. So be sure to reach out and uh, we can certainly chat further on that. Okay. So when we think about um, our survey here, uh, we're going to be moving on now to is the impacts of COVID-19 and how that's kind of affected our, our facilities here, right? So let's move in now to the COVID impacts and some of the data that we've seen with that. One of the first questions we asked for respondents here is when you responded to COVID-19, how did you respond to that? Uh, specifically, did you follow the government guidelines or did you have your own guidelines that were maybe above and beyond what the government had recommended? So what this table shows here is the three main uh, sectors of uh, industries or facilities. So we had services, manufacturing, and institutional. So again, services, this is primarily consumers, so restaurants, banking, things like that. Manufacturing is the production of goods. And then institutional, this is mostly, like I mentioned, public or private buildings, cities, states, uh, federal government, and that's primarily what falls into that category. Educational is also part of institutional. So the dark blue, uh, what that represents is the respondents, they only followed the CDC guidelines or the, the Canadian equivalent in terms of how they're going to clean their facilities. So 48% of services facilities follow the CDC, whereas 52% um, did above and beyond what the government was asking them to do. Manufacturing, you see that they're much more prone to go above and beyond what the government had recommended, or as institutional, um, they were a little bit less than half um, in terms of you know, going about, above and beyond what the government had recommended. Now, when we break this down by facility size, uh, the data is actually a lot more uh, trending uh, in terms of how this changes. So what this shows here is facility sizes that are less than 100,000 square feet. And this goes all the way down to more than 1 million square feet. So the changes here are not very, they're not huge changes here, but if you look at this, and if we're gonna mark this up here, let's see if I can do this. If you were to mark this down here, we can see here that there's a trend that kind of goes this direction as we look at this, right? So that as the facilities get bigger, they tend to follow their own recommendations and guidance as compared to the other uh, governmental recommendations. So again, I know that uh, COVID has in some ways uh, come to a close or things are wrapping up uh, mostly, uh, but this can be insightful for us as we think about future challenges that might come down from a emergency management standpoint and how uh, different organizations have responded to the mandates that were provided to them. Now, the next part of this here is that we're going to go through some data about what innovative practices uh, have respondents provided to us or said in regards to managing their facilities here. So what I want to do here is ask you all, if you could all uh, please engage for a moment here, uh, what was the best tool or practice that you found that's really effective in terms of responding to COVID-19? What's the best idea, the best tool that came up that you have found for that? If you could, you can take a picture of this QR code to take you to the website or go to your browser and go to slido.com and then type in 3016593. What was the best tool or practice that you found in your organization? I would love to hear from you. Go ahead and take a look at that and provide your comments. Let's we'll spend about a minute or two on this slide and I will see what folks uh, recommended. Best tool or idea that you came up with in your organization. So let's give you a couple of minutes here. Information sharing, excellent. Yeah, that's a big one. Any other ideas? Well, which side today, folks? That's all right. Last call for comments or questions. Best tool or idea that you came across or practice in your organization? I see somebody typing. 
It's going to be an amazing idea, I'm sure. Best idea or best tools, practices that you can come across your organization. All right, we'll give a few more seconds here and then uh, we'll move on. All right, pre screens questionnaires, absolutely. For people coming to the site, great. Yeah. So I think when I think about um, some of the other practices, um, and again, if you have other ideas, 3D visualization, yeah, that's a great one. I would love to hear more about that, what that actually means from a 3D standpoint, right? So when you think about 3D visualization, um, that's actually a number of people mentioned that, uh, may not necessarily three-dimensional, but uh, color coding those spaces in terms of here's where it's okay to go, and over here it's not okay. And they provided maps you know, of the facility as to what that looked like here. So let's go ahead and move on here. And I want to summarize some of the main comments from the respondents uh, that folks kind of had with regards to this particular topic, right? So what people said when it comes to, uh, especially on the janitorial custodial side of things that were effective, is increase the number of touch point cleanings. Uh, they had zoned responsibilities for cleaning. That was something they found to be effective. So what that means is we have somebody that is responsible for this area and make sure it's disinfected as opposed to team clean where we all just clean the overall facility. They, they, some people reported that having zone focus level cleaning was, was effective. Uh, some of the custodians had uh, companies had 12 hour turn times for cleaning the entire floor. Pretty impressive, right? Clean cards and offices. So they post cards that says, hey, this office has been sanitized. It's good to go. It's good to go. Uh, again, additional MERV filters, MERV 13 filters and additional UV units ultraviolet units and the unit, uh, HVAC uh, was also found to be um, effective. So to summarize the top practices, 83% uh, of the respondents said that additional cleaning was the biggest thing that they did, uh, followed by isolated or quarantining of uh, suspe suspected uh, infected persons. Contact testing, uh, testing and isolation, uh, building access was restricted and then other measures. So again, these are pretty uh, pretty common as we're aware, but these have also been uh, some of the major reported practices. Now switching gears here for a moment, in terms of some of the most common uh, work from home trends, right? So this is definitely a big topic and is still currently a big topic is uh, what percentage of people are working from home and into the future? So the first thing we asked about the respondents was from a facilities management staffing standpoint, what percentage of those folks are, are working from home? So what this chart here shows is that the percentage of staff, uh, the FM staff, um, that are working at home. So between one to 10% of the overall FM staff. And then these percentages represent how many respondents said that they are at this level. So for example, at institutional facilities, 22% of the respondents said that between one to 10% of their staff work from home, right? And as you go down here, it becomes less and less likely. And this makes sense, right? As facilities people, we have to be on site to maintain our buildings. And most respondents said that FM folks were on site, they were not working from home. And uh, that's a, a pretty common response we saw from everybody. The other thing we asked about too is from the facilities, what percentage of all the occupants, not just facilities people, work from home? And here's what we found here. We found that 11% of the employees can work remotely. 74% of them, some of the employees can work remotely, and 15% that everybody has to come back to the, to the site. Now, this is a pretty hot topic right now because uh, some of us say, well, we're going to allow some people to work from home. Other organizations are saying, no, everybody has to be on site, and there's some organizations that are kind of in between. I would characterize it now based on the data is that folks are not exactly sure what that's going to look like to the future, and we're currently navigating uh, what that looks like. The other thing we asked about too, and I thought this question was really quite interesting. Um, we asked respondents is, how's your building footprint changing in the next 35 years um, in regards to your building? So with regards to COVID-19 or other reasons, right? So 2% of the respondents said they're actually increasing their, their footprint, which maybe their healthcare, so they need to do that. But look at this, 47% of the respondents said they're having no change to their building footprint. Now, to me, 
that's really kind of interesting. And the reason being as to why I think this is really interesting is because if you see that about half the respondents are not changing the size of their buildings, and yet 74% of them say that some employees are going to be working remotely, to me, this suggests is that there's going to be fewer people on site, and yet the size of our buildings is remaining the same. To me, those don't quite add up here. So when we've talked to various uh, people, uh, facilities people about this as to why the discrepancy here, the main response has been, well, we're tied into leases and we can't you know, change uh, what those looks like. Right? We can't just you know, release, let go of our leases because we're tied into them and there's you know, major financial impacts if we do that. That's, that's one response. The other response has been is that if we were to let go of our space, we're not sure what the future looks like. In other words, if we let go of space that is really valuable to us, it's really beneficial, we let go of it, and then we realize, oh, we actually need that space, it's going to be much more costly and difficult to get new space if we have to you know, bring that back in in a few years. So I think uh, those are pretty good classifications or, or how we might describe how things are going with regards to space management inside of our facilities. Now, the North America report, it does also summarize this by the facilities use the number of building occupants, and the building size. So if you want more details, be sure to check out the report and you can get access to that information. So what this chart here shows is, again, the same information with regards to building footprint. We break it down by, again, different sectors, which is basically what the previous slide showed. Uh, here's another table here, too. We break it down by building size. So less than 100,000, 100,000, 200,000, all the way up to more than a million. And again, we have the percentage of people that are increasing size, no change, reducing footprint size, changing, but not because of COVID-19, and then those that are not sure. So if you are if you find yourself in this situation, thinking about the future with regards to your building footprint, uh, take a look at the report to kind of get the feel for what your peers are also thinking about doing, and that might be uh, beneficial for us, for you. The next thing we looked at here, and this is the only report I have found that provides this level of detail. We went through and we asked respondents to provide details about the cost impacts of social distancing and hygiene and sanitation because of COVID-19. So what the report does, it breaks it down by different demographic factors. We have industry sector, we have the primary use of the facility, and they have the number of building occupants. So we break it down by wayfinding, barriers, rearranging office furniture, security, uh, PPE. Now this is these first four are broken down by uh, cost per square foot, whereas this last was broken down by cost per occupant, teleworking, other costs. So we have the total cost here per square foot, and then we have total cost per building occupant. So if you're looking to get a really good feel as to what the actual cost impact uh, was because of COVID-19, this chart provides significant detail by lots of demographic factors that can help you with this. So that's social distancing. We also looked at a hygiene and sanitation cost. So hand sanitizer, isolation costs, sink runtime, paper towels, other costs. Again, we break that down by the total cost per square foot and the total cost per occupant. Again, by injury sector, facility use, number of building occupants, and size. So in summary here, if we're to summarize the overall cost impacts here, here's where these kind of fall. Again, the report has details uh, including this information. Of all the social distancing costs, 29% of those related to teleworking or helping people work remotely. 34% were related to PPE, so mask, um, uh, other things related to social distancing. On the hygiene and sanitation side of it, 33% uh, of that was related to hand sanitizer. 37% of that cost related to isolating, so making sure that people are by themselves in their offices. And then there's other cost as well, right? So again, uh, we have a lot of detail here that breaks it down. Here's the actual impact on our facilities, and you can get a feel for you know, what some of those uh, look like, right? Now, we also asked respondents, um, the reason why this next uh, section of the slides is useful is because how to respond to future conditions or future events that involve um, having to isolate people or having to send people home, right? We asked respondents, how did you handle positive cases of COVID-19? And here's what people told us, right? Uh, they had the, the same amount of contract to staff, but they added overtime cost. They had additional hours of cleaning during the day, plus electrostatic brain systems twice a week. 
This one here, uh, the one respondent said that they would bring in additional staff, but also third party people to enhance the feeling of safety amongst building occupants to make sure that we're actually addressing the issues, right? So maybe it had no real impact, but the fact that you have other workers, occupants in the buildings, and you see these third party experts coming in to clean the facilities, uh, people really found that to be effective to convince everybody in the building that we're actually trying to do a good job in terms of uh, cleaning up the building. A COVID care team to track illnesses and other notifications. And again, pandemic cleans were uh, done every single time they have a positive case. What this slide shows here is a summary of the different practices that were done. Uh, again, a lot of people, basically everybody said they had UV lights in their HVAC systems, uh, bipolar ionization, uh, shut down vacant areas and staggered workstation scheduling, and lots of other practices. Again, this is across hundreds of respondents, which is a good sample size to represent uh, what actually happened uh, with regards to the different facilities here. Some additional practices we looked at too, uh, organizations created outside eating areas to limit people in close quarters and break rooms. They opened up conference rooms for lunch rooms, again, so people could spread out. Uh, portable UV lighting systems, uh, hoteling, workspace pods. Again, I think that's gonna be more common in the future. Uh, requiring people to be fully vaccinated before they return to work. Discreeting the use of meeting rooms for medium to large capacity meetings. And again, ultraviolet light and fans and elevators to make sure that the air was clean. So that's a really good uh, detailed breakdown about what we've seen inside the facility and different things that we've seen to be um, effective from that standpoint. So um, if you have other practices or other things that you seem to be effective, be sure to let us know, but also check out the report for a lot more detail about those different practices. So to close out uh, today's discussion, I wanna spend uh, just a few minutes here talking about how do we actually find an expert janitorial contractor? Uh, that's what, that those service providers, the custodians or on-site janitor, uh, jan janitors were extremely helpful and capable in responding to COVID-19. And so naturally the question becomes, well, we have found in a lot of our work is, well, how do we actually find companies that can do a good job with this and how do we specify out what they're going to do? So to help us set the stage of what this conversation looks like is I would like us first to think about your statement of work with regards to janitorial contracting, right? So let's say that you're gonna put up a scope that describes here's what we need to do from a custodial standpoint, right? What I want you to do here is ask yourself that if you're the suppliers, the, janitor, the, the custodial companies that are gonna be proposing to work with your organization, imagine that think that your scope of work about the project is unclear, or maybe it's uh, you know overly prescriptive, it's not realistic, uh, the owner is you know, misunderstands the needs. They think that the procurement process you're using is not fair. So imagine that you're a custodial company that's looking to propose and you thought these things about the organization they're looking to work for. What impact would that have? What we have found here is that this results in fewer proposals, lower quality proposals, pricing that's all over the place, and frankly, is a very challenging procurement experience because it's not relevant to what we're actually considering around, right? So when you think about what an effective statement of work is here, the main thing you should be seeking to answer as you go out to hire a custodial company is what does an expert vendor, supplier need to know? And specifically, what's gonna allow them to provide the best price, the best plan to minimize their contingency and really stop them from walking away? If they are convinced that you as an owner are really trying to hire experts, and you already don't have your favorite, that is much more likely to entice somebody to come in and provide an outstanding proposal to your, to your group, right? So keep that in mind as you work on this year, right? Now, I wanna be clear here, right? Letter, red alert status here. Your statement of work is absolutely crucial to make this a positive experience. Writing a good quality statement of work is really, really important. Now, I wanna be honest here, folks. Um, Writing that statement of work is really difficult, and I understand that. What I would do is keep it at a high level and make sure you're clearly described to the vendors why you're doing this project. In fact, we have an entire course about writing statements of work. If you have an interest in that, be sure to reach out to me. Uh, but writing that statement of work and make sure to address what the vendors need to know is absolutely crucial here. 
Now, when you think about how do you pick the vendors that are going to provide the services for you, there's really two things I'd recommend you think about as you go through and do this. Focus on two things here, risk and value. Focus on what makes a difference, right? Um, in this crazy example here, like if I'm looking to to buy this Hummer, this, this car here, right? I'm not interested in the color of the body, right? I'm not interested in what types of windows it has because it's missing wheels, right? It doesn't matter what all those other details look like because the car doesn't have any wheels. So how does that apply to hiring a janitor, right? Uh, hiring a custodial company. Focus on things that make a difference. Things that we have found that do not make a difference when you're trying to hire somebody is their resumes. Resumes don't make a difference, right? Because they all look about the same. They all look really good. Organizational charts doesn't really make a difference here. What does make a difference is focus on what risks they see and how they're going to minimize that value. I would recommend that when you talk to your potential custodial services companies is ask them in terms of delivering product, the this, this service to our, our to our FM group, what are the major risks that you see and how are you going to minimize those different risks? The second part of that then is any value added ideas. Is there anything above and beyond the scope that we're asking for that would be beneficial to us? What we have found across all of our research on thousands of projects that we've worked on, these two things is what risk do you see and is there anything else that we should be thinking about are really, really beneficial to identify the expert vendors. Why is that? Because what we have found is that if I have an expert vendor that has not really thought, or a vendor that hasn't thought about our project, they can't answer those questions. If you ask somebody, hey, what's going to go wrong on my project? and explain to us how you're going to mitigate those issues, answering that question requires them to actually know what they're going to do. And it makes it much easier for us as an FM to determine what we're going to, to do uh, from that aspect, right? So we have a couple of examples here. So we have, uh, this one was actually a residential hall. Uh, they're building a new dorm. And we use this process to talk with the vendors to see you know, what ideas they have here. So team one, their main issue here is that they don't have the owner doesn't have enough money to deal with the project, right? Anybody seen that before, right? Of course, all of us, right? We don't have enough money. So contractor one, supplier one said that, well, by optimizing the building location using a hybrid design and exploring strong fundamental, fundamental architectural design processes and providing an optimum solution, as design progresses, continuous verification of the budget will be utilized to ensure success, all right? Now, when you read this here, what do you think about? Let's say you're trying to hire a vendor. That's what team one says. How do you respond to that? Right, so think about it. I mean, when I see this, what I kind of think about is that that's, that's pretty generic, right? That's marketing. It's not a plan as to what they're going to do to provide a solution that's within the budget. Team two, the owner can be assured that the budget is not a risk. They have a world-class team with lots of connections to a wide range of high performing suppliers to ensure they always get the best prices and ensure that the budget is met, right? Again, when you look at this here, what it feels like to me is that they're gonna say whatever we think we wanna hear to get the job. There's no plan behind what they're actually going to do here. Here's team three, here's what they said. All right, the, bonus, the owner's budget cannot accommodate the building program as per the requirements. See the value add a plan for cost saving ideas. So then what you do is you flip to the value added plan that I mentioned, and here's what they said. Change out the underground parkade, $2 million savings. Reduction or change of the finishes out, $67,000. Some other additional design efficiencies, savings $1 million. Now, when you think about these responses compared to like these two over here, clearly this firm has thought about your specific project, right? You don't have to accept these ideas here. They're just ideas, they're suggestions that at the end of the day would make the process a lot better that you can think about, or they have they have clearly thought about this from your specific project. On this, this example over here, you could copy and paste that onto any proposal. This one here, this can only be applied to this specific project. So if you're an FM and you're looking to hire somebody, clearly we'd prefer to hire team three and provide a lot of good details about what's actually going to go on here, right? So let's take a look at some uh, janitorial specific examples using this risk uh, perspective here, right? So the risk one is that the weather 
might be a risk. Carpooling from other locations is how they're going to minimize that because they have to have people come in to clean the building and then leave. If they can't get to the building, that's going to be an issue, right? So here's what one firm said, right? It's pretty short, doesn't have a lot of details, and it's kind of mediocre, right? Here's what somebody else said, a different firm on the same project. Severe weather, such as snowstorms, means that people can't get to the job site. They said that we actually have a snow removal provider that we work with. And in those cases here, they'll come in and make sure that our staff can still get to your job site. And then what they do down here is they provide some examples about here's what we've done that in the past year, right? So when you think about this here, if you're looking at vendor one here versus vendor two down here, clearly vendor two has a plan. We know what the issue is and that as a facilities person looking at this, I feel a lot more comfortable with the second firm because they have a plan. Again, this is not a resume. This is not marketing information. This tells us here's what we're going to do if we can't get B job site. All right, here's another one. Um, Ristenberg, this is uh, understand the value of expertise. So many times in our RFP is when we specify janitorial services for cleaning, like maybe COVID-19 extra cleaning, we describe these minimum levels of performance that we want to do here, right? So in this case here, the university has specified what our level, minimum level of expectation is, right? What the vendor came in and says that what you've described here is not actually going to meet your expectations. You've asked for one thing, but we know they're actually thinking about something else. So therefore, what we're going to do is provide a higher level of service and care that actually meets what you're asking for here, right? So the owner asked for one thing, the vendors knew that it's actually better to do a different way and they provide some details as to what that actually looks like and why this is a good idea. Value added, uh, there's lots of ideas here that from a custodial standpoint might be a good idea. You may have specified clean the building, but this contractor here, they can also clean the, the parking lot at a cost, you know, whatever this, this structure is, right? So just because we ask for something and we don't ask for everything, doesn't mean that this is the end of the, the deal here because the vendors, when you ask them, provide us the best way to deliver this contract, the vendors now are open to providing good ideas. What I have found is that if the vendors, the janitor, the custodial companies are convinced that you actually are looking to hear their ideas and their expertise, they're much more willing to provide these good ideas if they think that you're actually open to listening to these ideas. You don't have to do it, but these are really good ways to think about how do we get new ideas, expertise onto our projects here. Now, once you have a vendor in place, what we have found here is that having auditing of the services can be really, be really effective with this, right? So metrics, when you think about how do we measure performance, they need to have a purpose and not just for the sake of collecting data or more importantly, is not collecting metrics to punish people, right? Because as soon as you start using those metrics to have a consequence, a negative consequence to people, what we have found is that people stop doing it. So what we'd like to think about this is as, as po positive accountability, is helping people get better at their jobs, helping the suppliers, helping our own internal people perform better based on the types of metrics that we're using here, right? So how do we improve? By having those data, what does the supplier recommend? And we actually have a full uh, white paper or uh, a case study that walks through this uh, in detail. So if you're looking to you know, set up janitorial auditing or different practices related to that, be sure to go to the website uh, simplar.com slash janitorial and uh, take a look at the articles and uh, those might be uh, beneficial uh, for you. So in summary here, to kind of wrap everything up here, when you think about using metrics and tying this all together from you know, managing COVID-19 and the costs associated with that, our primary goal here when you think about metrics is to be able to get what you paid for and being able to prove it. That's the key with it, right? If we pay for something, we need to be able to show that we actually got what we paid for. And what we have found, and especially when, when working with expert suppliers, is that they are the best ones to do that. I would ask your suppliers, your uh, janitorial uh, suppliers companies, is ask them what is the best way to show that you all are doing a good job? What recommendations or metrics do you recommend that we consider as we go forward and, and think about this? So in summary here, some of the, the key considerations is to start small and do what you can today. If you've not measured or benchmarked your services before, 
uh, whether it's COVID-19 or just overall processes, start with something, just do whatever you can. That's that's the best way to get started. The other thing I'd recommend you to do as well is to write down your own lessons learned from COVID, right? What's the best thing that you learned in your facility that you should think about uh, next time? Write it down in a Word document, save it, memorialize it, tell people about it because there's gonna be future challenges, right? And if we have this documented, we can look at that to make better future outcomes for our facilities. And this report and today's presentation hopefully provides some good details about what we can think about the next time this happens, right? The other thing you need to think about too is that effective benchmarking leads to effective business cases. That's why we like benchmarking done well. If you collect data that doesn't allow you to change or to get better or to improve something, that data is not really very helpful um, as we think about uh, the future with this. So in summary here, uh, our view and my recommendation is that FM as a as a profession needs to become data driven, right? And that's that's a whole other discussion that's tied to benchmarking, but those are some key things to think about as we go through here, right? If you do have any questions or you'd like a copy of today's uh, presentation or that white paper I mentioned, be sure to drop me an email, jake.smithwick at uncc.edu. I'd be more than happy to talk with you. But at this point in time, we'll go ahead and open it up for a Q&A if there is anything else. Any questions or comments from anybody? Questions or comments? Just popping on to LinkedIn here to see if we have uh, any other comments here. All right. Thank you, Jake. Uh, for the questions, yeah, Nick, I'll just turn the time back over to you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for an excellent webinar, Jake. Um, thank you for everybody attending today. We look forward to your attendance at our future webinars. If there's any questions, please drop Jake or myself a, an email and we'll follow up. Thank you. All right, take care, everybody. Bye.